Hi again, I'm Dr. Christina Dervatis. Uh, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist in Newmarket, Ontario, Canada. Thanks for watching my YouTube channel, which is devoted to intrauterine and contraception. I've created this as a resource for my own patients and for anyone else on the internet who is looking for information about IUC and uh, IUD use. Today's video is basically just going to be an overview of exactly what you would hear in my office if you were coming to see me for an IUD insertion appointment. So exactly what we would go through in the office, the exact details uh, and information that I would provide to all of my patients having an IUC inserted, including uh, the after insertion follow-up instructions. So. Um, if you have an appointment booked with me in the future, you can watch this as sort of a sneak preview of what to, what's to come. If you've already had an appointment with me and just want a refresher of some of the details um, of what we've gone over uh, and some reminders about what to look out for and instructions. Uh, I know I sometimes speak a little bit quickly in the office. Uh, I've certainly been told that before and I apologize, but um, hopefully having this video gives you the opportunity to go back and uh, review a few things if you've uh, forgotten from the office. Um, so starting uh, at the very beginning of the visit, we would just start by taking a medical history, asking you about your past medical history, previous surgeries, um, your menstrual history, uh, your current and past contraceptive uh, history in terms of what methods you've already tried and if you've had problems with any of them or any side effects, uh, we would discuss that and briefly discuss uh, other options. Um, in terms of other important history, I'd asked about any history of any sexually transmitted infections, um, particularly chlamydia or gonorrhea. Um, in the case of patients who've had previous uh, pelvic infections or sexually transmitted infections, it does not mean that you can't have an IUD ever in your life. I just would want to check to make sure that the infections were successfully treated, that there weren't any recent symptoms um, that might suggest infection. Uh, I'd look into whether or not any recent testing had been done. Uh, so that's an important part of the history taking. Um, I would go through various parts of your medical history to make sure that you don't have any contraindications to using an IUD. I'll address that in a, a separate video uh, in terms of who can and can't use an IUD, but basically that would be part of the history taking. Um, I'd ask about your current sexual activity, how long you've been with your current partner. Uh, for those in new relationships or about to enter into new relationships, I would uh, remind them that condoms uh, are really still important for sexually transmitted infection prevention. The IUD alone does not prevent sexually transmitted infections. So uh, in anyone who's using an IUD to prevent pregnancy, still very, very important to use condoms with new partners to prevent STIs. Then I'd briefly move into a discussion about specifically uh, those things that pertain to IUD use that the patient needs to know. Uh, number one, I would talk about the failure rate of the IUD. The IUD is very, very effective, one of the most effective options that we have available, which is why we recommend it as first line contraception, but the failure rate is not zero. So there's about a two in a thousand chance of pregnancy with a rare chance of tubal pregnancy uh, when we look at the intrauterine contraceptive devices that have levonorgestrel or progesterone within them. So the hormonal IUDs, that would be Marina and Kylina would be the uh, two number one uh, brands used in uh, Canada. So a two in a thousand chance of pregnancy with a rare chance of tubal pregnancy. For copper IUDs, the rate is slightly higher. It's about a six to eight in a thousand chance of pregnancy. I would talk about the low infection risk with uh, regards to IUDs. Um, it's rare if you've not had previous pelvic infections or aren't having unsafe sex, but there is a small risk of infection with the IUC insertion procedure. The highest risk window for infection would be in the, th the first three weeks after insertion. So any infections that happen far beyond that are usually not related to the IUD. Um, the next thing I talk about is expulsion. So expulsion is when the IUD actually sort of is extruded from the uterus or falls out. Um, the rate of that happening depends on the patient, depends on a number of factors, including patient age, anatomy, whether or not there's been a recent pregnancy and delivery. 
Um, but bottom line, because of that small risk of the IUD falling out, it's really important for patients to come back and see me a month after the insertion uh, procedure so that I can check to make sure that the IUD is in good position. And also for that reason, I advise patients that they should be using backup contraception for the first month um, until they see me back to make sure that the IUD is in good position. So one month visit after the insertion, very important. Also important to be using backup contraception until that point in time. Um, I talk about a uh, risk called perforation. Perforation means that the IUD goes through the uterus, either at the time of insertion or subsequently. It's very, very rare, about a one in a thousand chance that an IUD would go through the uterus and perforate. Um, but I still talk to all of my patients about this risk, risk, even though it's really, really rare, I want them all to understand um, the importance of coming for the follow-up visit so that we can make sure that the IUD is in proper position. So we talk about that. If there was an IUD perforation, it would require a day surgery usually to retrieve the IUD. Um, but again, all of this is really, really rare, but just to emphasize the importance of coming uh, back for the one month follow-up appointment. I will talk to patients about vaginal bleeding that they might expect after the insertion process. With all IUD insertions, there's a bit of an adjustment phase for the first four to six weeks after the IUD goes in. And so you might expect some unpredictable bleeding uh, and some light cramping. It shouldn't be super, super heavy bleeding. Usually most patients are just using a liner or a light days pad, but it can be pretty annoying and it can last for up to four to six weeks, sometimes even a little bit longer. But I mention it to patients so that they know that it's normal um, and to let them know that over time that bleeding is going to get better. It's not how it's going to be for the entire time that you're using the IUD. If a patient is uh, having a Marina or Kylina inserted, so a progesterone containing IUD, I let them know that most women enjoy less heavy, less painful periods with um, a progesterone containing IUD. Um, about 90% of women may notice an improvement in menstrual bleeding and about 70% may notice less uh, cramps with cycles. And anywhere from 20 to 30% may actually not even have a menstrual cycle at all. Uh, and that's normal, it's not unhealthy. Um, I'll do a whole separate video talking about this um, just to reassure patients that it's not something worrisome if you have a progesterone containing IUD and you aren't having a menstrual cycle. It's just a side effect of the progesterone thinning out the lining of the uterus and sort of a bonus uh, not to have to have it to deal with any menstrual bleeding. So I talk about all of that. Now, if a patient has chosen a copper IUD, um, the counseling is a little bit different in that Many women who are using a copper IUD might actually expect the opposite. They may have slightly heavier, slightly more painful cycles. Uh, so for that reason, I tend to recommend the progesterone containing IUDs over the copper IUDs. Um, but for various reasons, uh, if a woman chooses a copper IUD, I just make sure that she understands that there's that potential for menstrual bleeding uh, and cramping to increase uh, with that particular IUD. After uh, going through all of that information, of course, I answer any questions, uh, and then we move on to the insertion um, of the IUD. I'm gonna sort of just skip over that uh, right now because I've mentioned it brief briefly in a previous video, and I'm going to do a separate whole video just dealing with the insertion process uh, itself. Um, and then I'm gonna skip ahead now to uh, instructions um, and details that I give patients for after the uh, insertion. So once the insertion has um, taken place, I let patients know that the cramping that they're having is most intense, usually for the first five to 10 minutes after the insertion, and then usually gets uh, much better after that. So how you're feeling right during the insertion process is not how you're gonna feel for hours and hours and days and days. And usually um, if uh, the cramps are still bothering you, I'd recommend extra strength Advil, extra strength Tylenol, or both combined. And that's usually enough to deal with the cramping. Um, bleeding can be expected. Uh, again, it shouldn't be super, super heavy bleeding. 
Um, I do ask patients to avoid um, tampons and the Diva Cup just for the first three weeks after insertion. This isn't an official guideline or didn't come from a particular study. I admit that this is just my own personal um, advice to patients. My thinking is that if the first three weeks is the highest risk window for infection, uh, I'd prefer to avoid having any foreign bodies in the vaginal area that might increase the risk for infection. So that has been my own personal advice to patients um, to avoid tampons and the Diva Cup uh, for those first three weeks. Thereafter, it's absolutely fine to use tampons or the Diva Cup. Um, immediately after the insertion process, some patients might feel a little bit dizzy or lightheaded or woozy. This is a very common response. Um, it's similar to patients feeling a little bit woozy uh, on occasion after they've given blood or at the site of blood some patients are sensitive that way very common usually gets better in a matter of five to ten minutes or so but i make sure that patients understand that if they're feeling lightheaded woozy nauseous generally unwell to just stay lying down uh, until the feeling passes and then usually um, as i mentioned in a few minutes things are better um, i review the signs of infection uh, so signs of infection to look out for would be fevers chills, constant lower abdominal pain, foul discharge, anything like that going on, I would want to hear back from the patient sooner than the one month follow-up visit. Now, uh, if there happens to be any emergencies or symptoms that are concerning something going on that the patient needs help after hours when I'm not available in the office, uh, I instruct patients that they can contact their family physician, a walk-in clinic, or the emergency room uh, if need be. It's really, really rare that that would be necessary, but just so patients know where to go uh, if they need help and I'm not available. Um, I give the patients a card that comes uh, provided by the manufacturer of the IUD. Uh, the card is to be able to write the date that the IUD was inserted, and then the patient keeps the card someplace safe so that they have a way of remembering um, when the IUD is inserted and can remind themselves when the IUD is uh, due for replacement. That's usually in about five years and uh, for most of the commonly prescribed IUDs. Um, and so I instruct patients that at the five-year follow-up, when we're due to replace the IUD, if their family doctor refers them to my clinic and they bring the IUD with them, I simply take out the old IUD, put in the new IUD at the same visit. In that instance, there wouldn't be any need for blood work prior to the appointment because I know that the patient uh, is not pregnant because they have an IUD in place. That said, I again remind patients of the less than 1% chance of uh, a pregnancy, uh, including tubal pregnancy, uh, that could occur with an IUD, uh, so that if there was any reason that any patient thought that they might be pregnant with an IUD in place, that we would need to sort things out right away and they would need to seek follow-up right away if that were to happen. I talk to patients about um, checking the strings. Not everyone is comfortable doing this. It's not absolutely mandatory, um, but um, as further reassurance that the IUD is, in, is still in good position, some women will get into the habit of periodically in the shower or in the tub to reach up and actually feel the strings to make sure that the IUD is in good position. Uh, sometimes the strings can creep a little bit into the cervical canal and may be more difficult to palpate um, and uh, that's not necessarily a problem, but uh, bottom line is that's one option for women to be able to check to make sure that things are still in good position. Even after the one month follow-up visit, there is a still a very rare chance that the IUD could fall out. Other signs, other than not being able to feel the strings, other signs would be, well, obviously if there was something T-shaped floating in the toilet, that would be fairly obvious. Or if you were using a progesterone containing IUG, uh, IUD, rather, if you went from uh, very light cycles to suddenly much heavier cycles, that could be a sign that something had shifted and might be a reason to um, seek follow up. So those are some of the things that I review. Um, I talk to patients just about pap testing, just to remind them that paps are done every three years are the current Ontario guidelines. Uh, if paps are negative, um, and I remind patients when their next pap is due. Um, and um, in some cases, in addition to the uh, one month follow up, uh, I might 
decide to order an ultrasound um, to check on the position of the IUD after it's been inserted. Some insertions are a little bit more challenging than others. Everyone's anatomy is a little bit different. So in some instances, I may elect to um, order an ultrasound after IUD placement just to confirm that things are where they need to be. One additional point that I'm just adding in here, um, I realized that I hadn't spoken about sexual activity after an IUD is inserted um, and instructions uh, with regards to that. No restrictions in terms of when you can resume sexual activity after an IUD has been inserted, but I do remind all patients that because of the chance of expulsion um, and so on, that I would want patients to be using backup contraception uh, until they see me back for the follow-up checkup in one month. Uh, whether that be condoms or if a patient's on the birth control pill, they can simply continue the birth control pill right until um, the follow-up visit uh, with me. Um, but no restrictions in terms of activity as long as you're using backup contraception. Uh, and with regards to physical activities such as exercise, going to the gym, what have you, swimming, all of that sort of stuff, no restrictions after an IUC insertion. So that is um, just a brief overview of basically everything that I would talk about in an IUC clinic insertion uh, appointment. So for those of you who are coming to see me, you've had a sneak preview. For those of you who've already seen me, uh, if there's something that you've forgotten, you can review this video um, and uh, stay tuned. I'm going to continue to uh, produce some more videos answering some of the most frequently asked uh, questions uh, about IUDs. And uh, don't forget to tell your friends and help spread the word about IUC. Uh, and I'll just close with reiterating the motto of my office, which is five minutes to insert an IUD, five years of worry-free contraception. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.